Tammy patted my knee and said, you're up. I appreciate those reminders. Uh, open your Bibles, if you would, to John 1, 35-42. John chapter 1, 35-42. I am thankful Chad was here this morning lead singing and that I didn't have to. Uh, I didn't ask for an amen, honey. Um, but I'll take it. And uh, it's good to see everybody, several out of town, what have you, but we're together uh, to honor and to worship our God as He has directed us. And don't laugh at this. But it was 1979 when I started kindergarten. And I came home from kindergarten one day feeling just fine. But I woke up the next morning and I had these red blotches from my head to my toes itching horribly. Chicken pox. Now, my mother love her heart, is a let's not talk about it, let's get it done type of woman. And so she decided, she's, what, 22, 23 at the time, she decides that with her two younger children, she's going to get rid of this childhood disease in one fell swoop. And so she puts me in bed, and puts my brothers in bed with me. So they'll get chicken pox, and she can be done with it all together. In medical terminology, I was patient zero, the one who brought a disease into a new environment. I, you've had experiences with patient zero before. Any of you had a child come home from school and next thing you know, you yourself are vomiting and, and diarrhea and all that good stuff? I hadn't had a stomach virus in 20 years. Our kids go to school, next thing you know, I'm sick as a dog. You ever hugged a brother or sister at church and then you find out that he or she was sick and carrying some disease, some illness that you get? Ever had company come and they leave behind some nice little bug for you? I love Stephen King. He is my favorite author. I don't know what a psychologist might say about that, but I love Stephen King. And my absolute favorite novel of his is The Stand. In The Stand... A man by the name of Charles D. Campion is working at a military base in California where they are researching biological warfare. There is an accident at the lab one night when Campion is working. The guard, uh, he, he's a guard, and there at the guard booth, it's supposed to slam shut as soon as there's an incident not let him out. He, he'll die there. That's the plan. But somehow the system malfunctions and he's able to get out. He gets his wife and his baby daughter and they drive clear to Texas and then they succumb to Captain Trips. But they've met a whole bunch of people along the way. They encounter some folks at a gas station in Arnett, Texas. And next thing you know, 99.4% of the world's population is dead from Captain Trips. Campion, patient zero, the one who allowed that germ to escape into the population. There are, you know, some rather famous patient zero. You ever heard of Typhoid Mary? Mary Malone, she supposedly, as a cook, infected at least 51 people. 
with typhoid fever. It's believed that a flight attendant, a gay flight attendant, by the name of Gaten Dugan, who had multiple partners, brought AIDS into the United States. He was patient zero for AIDS in this country. There's some controversy about that, yet that's the typical accepted explanation. And then maybe, you, you know, there's a lot of theories and other things about this. But it might have been that a guy eating bat suit. Now, I don't understand that in the least. But apparently, some say that a guy eating bat suit let COVID into our world this morning. What we want to do is to think about patient zero. And I want you to become patient zero. I want me to become patient zero. No, 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 no. We're not talking about taking some illness and disease and spreading it into this world. Rather, we want to take the gospel of Jesus and to take it into the world. Just like I was infected with chicken pox and gave it to my brothers. Just like typhoid Mary spread typhoid fever, Gaten Dugas, AIDS, and that guy with bad soup, COVID, we want to take the gospel and to give it to other people. And as you look at John 1, I want you to understand this important lesson. You, you can change the world. People talk about how they're going to make the world a better place. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you this morning how you can make the world a better place. And how you yourself can change the world. Oh, you might think, I'm insignificant, I don't matter, nobody's ever going to know my name, it doesn't matter. You can change the world. And John 1, 35-42 tells you how you can change the world. Notice what we read. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. So John says, as he sees Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God. And two disciples, we'll find out in a second that one is Andrew, the other more than likely is the Apostle John writing this epistle, this book. They're standing there with John. John sees Jesus, says, Behold the Lamb of God. And they follow him. Jesus turns around and says, What are you looking for? What are you seeking? And they say, Rabbi, meaning teacher. And Jesus says, come and stay with me. You know that's Jesus. Jesus is inviting, come to me, all you who labor, and I will give you rest. Jesus welcomes these two disciples. And they spend the afternoon, the evening with him. It's about four o'clock in the afternoon. And they spend the rest of the day with him. Wouldn't you like to know what they discussed? What their, their discussions were and all that Jesus taught them. We don't know that, but we know what happened next. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew. 
Simon Peter's brother. Andrew is mentioned as Simon Peter's brother because Simon was far more well known than was Andrew. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. Now notice, John referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God. When Andrew goes to Simon, he says, we have found the Messiah. His faith has grown. He understands now who Jesus is after that afternoon with the Lord. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him, looked at Simon, and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means... Peter. Andrew had a history of bringing people to Jesus. When Jesus fed the 5,000, it was Andrew who found that boy with his loaves and fishes and brought him to Jesus. When some Greeks wanted to encounter Jesus, it was Philip who went and found Andrew before he went to Jesus and said, we've got some people who want to meet the Lord. Now, why would Philip go to Andrew instead of Jesus? Think about that for a second. I, I don't want to make too much of it, but it seems to be that Andrew had this way with and that he had this habit, if you will, of bringing people to Jesus. And so when these Greeks want to meet the Lord, Philip first goes and takes them to Andrew. And they go together to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, here's the point I want to make. Andrew changed the history of the world by bringing his brother to Jesus. Think about it. Andrew, we're told in the text, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, because Andrew's not as well known as Peter was. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, changed world history by bringing his brother to Jesus. Because he brought his brother to Jesus, Peter made that confession, that great confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because Simon made that confession, Jesus gave him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Peter used the keys of the kingdom at Pentecost to open the doors of that kingdom. He told that crowd there what they needed to do to be saved. Peter later would take those same keys and open the kingdom to Gentiles, us, and tell Cornelius and his household what they needed to do. Now, brothers and sisters, I, I, I want you to think about it. Really and truly, you sit here this morning, you can have the forgiveness of your sins because Andrew went and found Peter and took him to Jesus. Think about that. You have the forgiveness of your sins because Andrew went and found Peter. Simon Peter, and took him to Jesus. You may think, now wait a minute, Justin. We have forgiveness because Jesus died for our sins. Absolutely right. We have justification because of the resurrection of the Lord. You're right. 
but without Peter's having the key to the kingdom, that kingdom would have never been opened. Without Peter going to Cornelius, Gentiles, you and me, we could never be saved. Oh yes, I know God had a plan for saving the world. And God was going to enact His plan. God was going to carry out His plan like He did. And God could have found someone besides Simon Peter to take care of that. I, I understand that. Let me ask you a question. How did God do it? How did He? God used Simon Peter. And God was able to use Simon Peter because of Andrew. And because Andrew went and took his brother to Jesus. And you and I are able to have forgiveness of our sins because Andrew took his brother to Jesus. And understand without any doubt, you, you, can change the history of the world. On my mother's side, I am the fourth generation to be a member of the church. My great-grandparents went to a revival one night they went home to get clothes and went to the creek to be baptized. I don't know the name of the person who invited them. I don't know the name of the preacher that night. I don't know who baptized them. My great-grandfather would later help construct the building where that congregation of God's people met. They did a lot of work in the church. Someone whose name I do not know invited them to a gospel meeting. Or they saw it advertised by the work of someone whose name I do not know. They heard the gospel preached by someone whose name I do not know. And generations have been changed because of those unknown people who did the Lord's work. You can change the world. You can change generations yet to come by simply offering an invitation to come. They're having Bring a Friend Day. And one invitation, brothers and sisters, one invitation can change the world. You don't know what that invitation could do. You don't know what generations down the road might be like because you invite that one person to come. Elders, preachers, Bible class teachers, preachers' wives, elders' wives could come because of that one invitation. Thousands of people may come to Jesus because of that one invitation. You don't know what might happen. Do you think Andrew had any idea who Peter would be when he took him to Jesus? Do you think that Andrew knew his brother would open the keys of the kingdom? Would allow people to come into the kingdom of God? He simply took his brother to Jesus and he changed the world because of it. Your invitation can change the world. No, God's not going to give that person a key to the kingdom of heaven. You need to know that. Yet you don't know what's going to happen and what good can be done and for generations yet to come. So how do you change the world? How do you go about 
changing the world with the gospel of Jesus. Well, I think you do it the same way Andrew did in this text. If we continue with the illustration of patient zero, the first thing you have to do is infect yourself. You know, I had to have chicken pox to come home and infect my brothers. The guy eating bat soup had to get COVID to infect others. Typhoid Mary had to have typhoid to infect others. If you want to infect others with Jesus, the first thing you need to do is be infected yourself. Andrew was infected with Jesus when he went to get his brother, son, and Peter. He and the other disciple, likely John, stayed with Jesus that afternoon. Now, I have no record of what the Lord discussed with them that day. It was truth. I, I know that, but I don't know specifically what they discussed. But yet, do you think Jesus would have sat there all afternoon and talked about the weather? Or about football or basketball or anything else? Well, there's a time and place for all that. You, you know that. But all afternoon, Jesus wouldn't have talked about such things. He talked about the kingdom of God. And when Andrew found Peter, he said, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And that tells me that Jesus taught these two disciples and John as they sat there in the house that afternoon. Peter's, or Simon's, or Andrew's faith had grown. He had heard about the Lamb of God. And now he goes and says to his brother, Son of Peter, we have found the Christ. If you're to be infected with Jesus, there is one place to go. His Word. His Word will infect you with Him, grow you in the faith. And you will be able to say to others, I have found the Christ, the Messiah. The words of Jesus are so very powerful and important. Jesus said, John 6, 63, The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. If you want life, you have to go to the words of Jesus. Again, our Lord said, John 12, 48, the word that I have spoken will judge you on the last day. When I was doing my master's degree, last thing I had to do was to take my comps. Big, long test. Took all day. But you know what I liked? They gave me all the questions the semester before I had to take my comps. I had the questions right in front of me. Oh yeah, I, I had to go do the research. I had to find the answers. I had to do all that good stuff. But I knew what the questions were. On Judgment Day, there's not going to be any surprises. We know the questions and the answers. The word that I have spoken will judge you on the last day, Jesus said. That very word. And you know that, according to Jesus, calls he gave his spirit to his disciples. The entire scriptures are his word. If you want to know who Jesus is, go to scripture. And if you're to be infected with the Lord, you take him to others. You have to be able to know this book. And brothers and sisters, I'm troubled. When I hear somebody say, you know, Justin, I just don't know enough to share my faith. 
And there are two big problems with that. First, you've identified a sin. Yes, I said a sin in your life. And two, you've implied you don't plan to do a single thing about it. Why is it a sin? If you're growing, if you're a Christian and been a Christian a while, I'm not talking about babes in Christ. Understand that. Understand that. But why is it a sin for someone to be a Christian for years and years and years, sit and hear the Bible preached and sit in Bible class and still have no idea how they can share their faith? Calls in the first place. We're commanded to do that. We're commanded to make disciples. Before His ascension back to heaven, the Lord said, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded. Now some will say, and I have heard this, Jesus was talking to the eleven. So that gets us off the hook. He was talking to the apostles. It, it didn't apply anymore to you or me. It, it context, he's speaking to the eleven apostles, eleven at that time. And it doesn't apply to us. Well, there's one major problem with that. What did Jesus say right in this text, in the context? Teaching them to observe all things that I have taught you. Jesus taught them to go and make disciples. And then they're to be taught to observe everything Jesus taught. Generations since then, have had that same command as they're taught to observe everything. Jesus saw the apostle. Do you know why else it's a major problem? A sin even? Because we're to be growing in our knowledge of God. You know, I hear some people say sometimes, oh, he's a babe in Christ. He's a young Christian. When they've been Christians 10 years or more. Well, it, I, I'm serious. Well, this time take that baby off and just refer to that person as a Christian. Because we're to be growing. Oh yes, when we come out of that water, you're drying off. I don't expect you to be able to share your faith and to know everything. I don't know everything, and neither do you. But I don't expect people to be at a level of maturity. But as the years go by, it's time for maturity. The author of Hebrews said that he would happily lay again the foundation if he had to. But he told those Christians, it's time to move on. It's time to grow in your faith and to learn the greater things. Peter wrote, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation that you may grow up. Not to stay stagnant, not to stay where you are, but to grow. This week, you need to make a commitment to spend time with Jesus, to be infected with Jesus by spending time in the Word. Take time to read the Gospel of John. That will help your faith. If you want to look at Jesus and say, here is the Lamb of God, here is the Christ, the Messiah, read the Gospel of John because the Gospel is written for that purpose. John said he wrote his gospel that you may come to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So if you want to believe he is the Son of God, if you want that firm foundation and a firm faith, 
read the Gospel of John. Oh, and do another thing. If you want to know how to convert people, read the book of Acts. Throughout that book, you see how people come to Jesus. You see how it takes the preaching of truth. You see how it takes repentance and confessing and baptism. And you see how people come to Jesus. You want to know how to share your faith? Look at how the early church did it. Over and over and over in the book of Acts. Oh yeah, I, I, I know. I just asked you to read two whole books of the Bible this week. I, I know we're busy. We have a long list of things we need to get done. But when you find something more important than planning for eternity, I'd like to be the first to know what it is. If God's not first on your list of priorities, brothers and sisters, you've got a problem. We need to take the time to get in the book. To know Jesus. To know His will for our lives that we can share it with others, and that we might be infected with Jesus and infect others with the Lord as well. And step two, you invite others. What Andrew did, he invited his brother to come to Jesus. Verses 41 and 42 of our text, Andrew first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. That's one of the most significant statements in all the Scripture. He brought him to Jesus. Whom will you bring to Jesus? You know shortly when you're going to have that opportunity. Oh, you do every Lord's Day. Don't hear me say otherwise. But to bring a friend day, you've got a special opportunity to say, come with me. To extend that invitation and to bring someone to Jesus. When you're sufficiently infected, you're supposed to bring people to Jesus. Luke 24, 47. Repentance and forgiveness of sin should, should be proclaimed in Jesus' name to all nations. All nations. Including right here in Deer Park, Texas. Forgiveness, repentance in His name. And as you invite others, you emulate the early church. Acts 8, 4. Those who were scattered after the persecution of Stephen went about preaching the word. Interestingly, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. These are not the apostles. These are, if you will, ordinary Christians taking and preaching the gospel everywhere they go. And as you do the same, you emulate them. What can you do? I want you to go home. I want you to make a list of five people you want to see in heaven. Now, listen to me. Don't put faithful Christians on that list. Okay? I'm not talking about those who are in Christ. I want you to go home. And make a list of at least five people you want to see in heaven who if the Lord were to come right now would spend eternity in devil's hell. That's what I want you to do. Think about those people. People who are lost in sin. People headed to an eternity of damnation away from God. Put those names on the list. And with that list, I want you to do two things. One, I want you to pray for each of those people by name. Get down on your knees and pray at least once a day 
for every name on that list. Pray for the opportunity to teach. The opportunity for them to come to Jesus. To know the truth of Jesus. And to come to salvation in his name. That's following the example of the Apostle Paul. Romans 10, 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, for Israel, is that they may be saved. Take those five names and pray that same prayer. Pray to God that they may be saved. Say. And two, I want you to make that invitation. I want you to invite them to come to Jesus. I want you to invite them to come on October the 17th. And listen, if they say, well, I'm busy, that day didn't work for me. Folks, there's 62 Sundays a year. Don't let them off the hook. This is a matter of heaven and hell. This is not about getting a hundred people here on that Sunday. Oh, we're going to do that, but, but it's not about just that. It's about changing the population of heaven. It's about people's coming to know Jesus, being forgiven of their sins, Changing their lives because of who Jesus is. That's what it's about. It's not a numbers game. It's about numbers only because each number represents a soul for whom Jesus died. That's why the numbers are important. And folks, don't tell me, don't tell me it can happen. That the Lord could change the world through Andrew's going and getting Peter and taking him to Jesus. Don't you tell me you can't change the world by taking that same message to a friend, to a family member, to someone lost in sin who needs that glorious gospel of Jesus. We're going to have some invitations printed pretty soon. Peggy and I are working on them. I saw a sample this morning that Peggy had done, and well, I'd sent her part of it, and she did part of it, and realized we didn't have the times or the address on there, and that's not going to work. But we'll, we'll add those things, and we'll have them. You can take them and give them. Put them on the refrigerator and they can be reminded when and where and all that good stuff. But you don't have to have that invitation to make an invitation. You don't have to have something in your hand to say, come with me. I don't think Andrew had some neat little postcard printed up in his hand to give, him to, give it to Andrew. Give it to Peter. I keep getting it mixed up. I'm sorry. Andrew didn't have anything in his hand to give to Peter. He said, come with me. We found the Messiah. Won't you do the same? Won't you say to those around you, come with me. I found the Messiah. Matthew 22, 9. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. There are our marching orders, if you will. Go invite as many as you find. And folks, we can't let those who teach error beat us to these people. We need to be there with the truth and help people come to know truth, come to know Jesus. And thus avoid and turn in hell and 
through eternity glorifying our God side by side in that Father's house where they're meeting us. Is it the case this morning that you yourself need to come to Jesus? You need to come and claim Him as your Lord, as your Messiah. Oh, He gives that invitation. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Are you weary and heavy laden this morning? You need to come to Jesus. You need to come. Let's come right now. Understand the scene.